you that are here tonight. And I know the Lord is here in a mighty way. We appreciate his presence so much. And thank you, Rick, for that uh, Holy Spirit groundwork you did. You really had no way of knowing what the Lord gave me tonight. And it uh, goes right along with that. We're going to redeem the time. We have a lot of friends in the audience, but I won't take time to recognize anyone because I'll overlook someone. And we want to get right into this. We're going for double. I know it's a gambler's analogy, but when I learned that you can just shoot for the whole pot, whatever that means, that's what I want to do. I, did, I, I know it's a gambler's analogy, I'm told, but I want to go for double. I want to go for broke. I don't know what uh, this means to you, but I want to lay it all on the line. All of it. I got nothing to lose, really. So much to gain. Second Kings, chapter 13. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 13, uh, verse 14 beginning. I'm reading from the New King James Version. I usually always read from the Old King James Version. John Limber gave me a very expensive New King James Version, so I'm getting used to that. And uh, besides, I gave my expensive Old King James away to a lady that uh, qualified for it. I was uptight one night and she came up and she just happened to be the last one to ask me, do you have a word from the Lord for me? And I said, uh, <laughs> took it as long as I could and I said, yes, lady, here's a whole book full of them. Just take them home and help yourself. There's 7,000 promises. And she didn't know that that was divine sarcasm. She accepted it as a great compliment and also took my $80 Bible <laughs> home with her. So I'm not going to do that tonight. I'll give you a word if you need it, but uh, if the Lord gives it to me first. Second Kings 13, 14, and here it is. Elisha had become sick with the illness which he would die. And then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Maybe that doesn't mean to you what it means to some of us, but when my great predecessor, the apostle Paul of old, said, You have 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers. The last thing God is going to do is fulfill Malachi 4.6. He's going to send the spirit of the Father, the spirit of Elijah. I'm not looking for another Elijah, but we could sure use that Father spirit. And that was passed on to Elisha in a double portion manner as Rick brought that out tonight. So here, the last of the great fathers is dying. The king is saying, my father, oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on on the king's hands. I want you to notice how obedient the king is here, to a point. And Elisha said, open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till they have been destroyed. Then he said, take the arrows, so he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground, so he struck three times and stopped. I tell you, the pride of man and the fear of man is deadly, and uh, this is in that Saul regime that Rick was talking about tonight. The fear of man is deadly. Uh, uh, Saul's one cop-out was, I was afraid of the people, and if you're not afraid of anyone tonight, you have just become 
a deadly weapon against the powers of darkness and against the devil and all of hell. You might even become a dreaded champion, as Bob Jones calls it. Uh, the Lord appeared to Bob and gave him a vision. I think he was in a trance, rather. And the Lord told him he was about to release his dread, uh, dreaded champions. And I believe that uh, for every sevenfold attack of the devil, for every complete attack that's against the church today, and there is that sevenfold complete attack, God is raising up enough dread champions, dreaded champions against the devil to cause the devil to really tremble. And uh, we have a couple of his warlocks here tonight. But I apologize to you. You don't know what you're getting mixed up in, and you're just getting lost in the crowd. You're just like two little snakes hissing and missing, and you're not making any headway at all. So God uh, have mercy on you. A universalist came to me a while back, and he said, don't you believe that eventually even the devil will be saved? And I said, oh, no, I don't believe that at all. But it's very interesting. He's been attending every one of our meetings lately, and he just might answer the invitation. <clears throat> but of course, I don't believe that. But um, I don't know when the New Agers and the Spiritualists that they have joined forces with will learn that greater is he that is in God's people when they stop all the rivalry and all the nonsense and get on the right side of obedience and do everything according to the will of God and according to the revelation of God. When, I, when the church, the fearful church, gets into full swing, you see, the church is not feared tonight, only mocked, but God has a number for in preparation at a cave somewhere. Maybe it's a cave in Kansas City, maybe it's a cave in Santa Ana, or a cave in Anaheim, or a cave in Denver, or a cave in San Diego, or a cave somewhere, but he's got caves all over the place, and he's developing cave men and cave people like David. They're, in the, they're under a certain anointing all the time. They're in the cave. But look out, God's dreaded champions, while old Saul is still anointed and while old Saul is still reigning, God has some obedient people that have separated themselves from the world of flesh and the devil. And they're going to come out with great power and great anointing and great instruction and divine w wisdom and divine information, and they're going to bring God's army together. But anyway, I find it very exciting to think of the divine possibility and the potential here in 2 Kings 13, 18. Elisha said, Take the arrows. So he took them, and he uh, said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. I don't know how many references I've found with, um, with the help of Mike Bickle that relate to this very thing. You should have, and I would have, you should believe on the glory, or you should rather believe, uh, said I not, if you would believe, if you would, you would receive, and you would see the glory of God. And so we have that all through the word. But anyway, Elisha is saying, you should have struck five or six times. Now six would have been going for double, and six would have been uh, the double amount. But I asked the Lord, why did he uh, let him say, let Elisha say, if you had only struck five times, uh, you would have gotten the same result. And I don't want to get hung up on numbers or anything, but you know, five represents the number of grace, six the number of man, but we're not getting into that part of it. I believe that would be applicable here with the five times. God was willing to allow the enemy to be destroyed and the enemy to be held back. And remember that those Syrians were just as wicked as Nazi Germany. They were as much a threat. They posed as much a threat to uh, the children of Israel as Nazi Germany uh, posed to the uh, children of Israel, I mean to the Jews. So Elisha said, had you done it five times or six, they would have, then you would have struck Syria until uh, uh, you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Oh, we must. Be very careful, and I mean we must be very careful what we hear because God is holding us accountable. Please turn to Mark 4, verse 24. Mark 4, verse 24. I'm preaching a message to you in a minute, a few minutes, entitled The Jealousy of God. And I want you to be very careful when you hear it. It is a prophetic message, 
Brother Leonard Ravenhill this morning, I believe by revelation, told you that I would be preaching this tonight. He had no way of knowing that in the natural. And God uh, has been uh, indelibly engraving this message on my heart from day to day, and especially for this conference or this whatever this thing is called, this gathering. So, <laughs> um, but it, it would be applicable tonight and very appropriate for me to read Mark 4, 24 as a warning from the Lord. And here it is. And Jesus said to them, Take heed, the old King James says, Be very careful. Be very careful what you hear. Jesus says fifteen times, He that hath an ear to hear, or he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He only alluded to tithing once in all the New Testament, and then uh, that most important subject was uh, wrapped up and done away with as far as the Lord was concerned. He just said, this you ought to do. I mean, there's some doctrines that are just um, uh, there. I mean, like the Trinity. I mean, it's uh, the, the most obvious thing in the world. But anyway, he said 15 times, he that hath ears to hear, or he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. So we do need to hear more and speak less. But I'm speaking tonight, so I am speaking because I've heard more <laughs> lately than I've been hearing. God would speak to every one of you, but he has a problem with you. He knows whether or not you have the intent to obey when he speaks. So he's a God of economy, and he's a practical God in that sense, so he doesn't bother to speak to you if you don't intend to obey. But if you have purposed in your heart to hear God to do business with heaven during this meeting, then God will begin to speak to you, and his word will come alive. And you must be very careful what you hear and not misinterpret or confuse what he says to you, because it can be very dangerous. It wasn't as dangerous before when you were tiptoeing through the tulips, and you were charismata, charismatic type of people, and you belong to the hallelujah, what's it to you club? But it's very serious in these last days. It's an end time brothers and sisters, and we're living in the closing time. God has all the time in the world to do what he has to do, but we don't have all the time in the world. The days are swiftly closing for you and me tonight, and we have just enough time to seek his face and not his hand. We have just enough time to sit before him and empty ourselves of all vain traditions and disavow our own knowledge and disclaim our own wisdom and come before him saying, Lord Jesus, I want to hear your voice. I want to obey your voice. I love you, and lovers seek each other's face. I'm seeking your face and not your hand, and I could care less what you open your hand and give me. I just want your face to be before me, and I want to inquire of you, as Rick said tonight, like David said, I want to inquire uh, of the sanctuary and of your sanctuary. I want to inquire of you. So let's be very careful. That's the warning. Be very careful what you hear for the same measure you use. It will be measured to you and to you who hear more, or rather to you hear, rather, you that hear, more will be given. Heavenly Father, help us to go for the double tonight and help us to hear twice as much as we've ever heard. Help us not to fear man and be shamed. Oh, dear God, let us forget everything but the purpose and the plan and our association with the Son of Man and with the Son of God tonight you're most concerned with. And Father, give us your Spirit. Let us see that in these last days it is the Father's Spirit that will come and turn the hearts of the children back to their parents and vice versa, and verse vice. Let us see that tonight and raise up. Father, show us some way to impart this. Let the Holy Ghost come in here unannounced for some unknown reason, and suddenly, as he did on the day of Pentecost, baptize our brains and impart to our hearts and our spirits something that goes beyond the soulish nature and something that divides asunder soul and spirit and deeply engrave on the tables of our heart the revelation of the Father. We'll give you the praise for it. I want to preface the next scripture reading is found in Numbers 25 with this. You can turn to Numbers 25, and we'll pick up with verse 1 in a minute. But the Lord revealed to me that we have had uh, three divisions. We've had the outer court. We've had the holy place. 
the inner court, and then we have yet to enter the Holy of Holies. And he also revealed that in the outer court we enjoyed the beholding and becoming principal. We in the outer court, we all, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and Catholics, all we, we begin to behold the Savior, the Son of God. And we became the saved. We beheld the Redeemer in the outer court. We became the redeemed. And then Jesus said something very striking. He said, uh, Think not that I am come into the world to bring peace, yea, rather division. And so he divides us up. He takes some out of the outer court, and he puts you in the holy place. And in the holy place, we have an association that's quite different. It was an association, an identification with the Son of God. But in the holy place, we have an association again with him, but this time with the Holy Spirit. We beheld the baptizer. We became the baptized. And, of course, there was a great division there, and it caused a lot of... Uh, a lot of problems, but the Lord was in that. But then he saved the very best for the last. He said, in the last final operation of this thing, it's going to get very serious. What well, a Father's spirit is stern. It is firm. It is unbelievably jealous. And he is going to deal in firmness, and he's going to deal in divine jealousy with his people. And he said, what you got away with in the outer court, what you got away with in the inner court, you'll be struck dead for in the Holy of Holies because it's the end time and the harvest is in the making and God the Father is jealous for a bride for his son and he's going to see to it that he finds the very best, that he removes all the spots and wrinkles and blemishes and that he perfects that bride and we haven't even gotten hardly into that process. God is still doing something with his people. But I'm willing for the operation to come tonight. Are you? All right, let's turn to Numbers 25, uh, verse 1, beginning. And here it is. Then Israel remained in Acacia Grove in the People began to commit harlotry, uh, harlotry rather, with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal, Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders, the leaders of the people, out and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. This may be the other side of God for some of you, especially you that can see only the beautiful banners, El Shaddai, Jehovah Raphi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah uh, Shalom, and all that. We, we just praise and worship God with all those names. But I have yet to see a banner in any fellowship or any church that reads uh, the God whose name is Jealous with a capital J. And yet that is as much God's name as any other name. Exodus 34, 10 speaks it expressly that the God whose name is Jealous, spell with a capital J, is jealous over you. I didn't realize how jealous he was until in my late 20s the angel of the Lord came to me and I didn't know what it meant at this time or at that time, or would not know what it meant for many years to come, until a, a professor, uh, while at the Dallas Theological Seminary at all places, asked me to tell him of something supernatural that had happened to me. I couldn't think of a better story than the angel's appearance when I was uh, called uh, to do a certain thing. And uh, I tell you, he got so turned on with that, I'm sure Jack Deere wouldn't mind me mentioning his name here tonight, but he get, just got so turned on with that, he said, Paul, that was, I described what happened. He said, Paul, that was your call to celibacy. Nobody in this unfriendly world of Protestants, there is simply no mentality with Protestant people for a celibate. There is no mentality for the Protestant charismatics for a single man. I have had 7,000 plus prophecies of whom I am to marry, when I am to marry, what I am to marry. And friends, if I didn't know God in a solid way, I would have to be a Joseph Smith to appreciate all of that stuff. But um, 
God sent his angel, and he told me he was jealous of me and was jealous of my companions. Well, the Lord knows even then I was a recluse. I stayed shut in, and I felt that if I didn't stay shut in before the Lord around the clock, I'd lose the gifting. So uh, I thought, well, only the only people around me are the godless people in the world. And uh, at that time, I was calling sins out by the dozens every night, and I didn't have any better sense than to... Uh, feel that I was called to do that. Somebody had told me I was, and so I thought they wanted it, and I thought that was what it was, and I enjoyed doing that much more than calling out sicknesses and diseases because uh, the people squirmed, and it was just a wonderful uh, entertainment. I had no entertainment in those days. I mean, television hadn't broken through yet, and I did that uh, as entertainment, I guess. Mike, if you'll remind me to pick up reading here with verse 5, um, I will. But you remind me just hold it 5. But do it right because I'll think it's a cue or something and uh, that I only have five more minutes. But anyway, I just want to take a little rabbit trail here. Uh, I'm noted for that. Uh, you know, there are two things I say that mean absolutely nothing, and I tried not to say it tonight without further ado. Thank the Lord I didn't say that because that means absolutely nothing. And the second uh, thing most important, unimportant thing I say is, uh, and now in closing, in about 15 minutes, I'll probably start in on that, but that's just uh, to relax you. It means absolutely nothing. So let's go on the rabbit trail for just a minute. I'm speaking about the jealousy of God tonight, and I'm going to finish reading through verse 13 and then give you the message, but I just want to take this little trip and down memory lane, I remember how jealous I was for the Lord. When I uh, was called as, as a small boy, I was 28, 9 years old, when the Lord spoke to me in an audible voice. And uh, I was a member of the First Baptist Church, which was a fashionable church, rather large, a suburb of Dallas, Texas, Garland, Texas. And uh, my pastor, Dr. Parrish, knew this something unusual about the visitation on my life after... I was saved at the First Baptist and then I had a visitation from the Lord just before I was nine years of age. And my grandmother was a Baptist, but she had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My grandmother, I mean my mother rather, was a Baptist, and she had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so they were kind of odd for the Baptist. But there was a great hunger in this pastor's heart. And when he recognized my grandmother as a seer and my mother as a an anointed person. He knew the Lord was with me in a strange way and eventually was to learn the secret of the Lord was with me in a way. And so he had taken me on sick calls to pray for the sick. And back in those days, of course, it was all, if it be thy will, O God. And I made up my mind as a nine-year-old boy that if I ever did get sick, I wanted to keep those, if it be thy will, people as far away from me as I possibly could because I've seen more people die when, if it be thy will, people come and pray. A Baptist pastor told me a while back, he said, please don't let any of my people in here. Don't let any of those, if it be thy will, people come in here. I'll die as sure as the world. I want people that believe that God is going to heal me until it's proven by death that he ain't. So let me tell you, I want to believe that it's God's will to heal you tonight until proven otherwise. But anyway... I'd go with him, and finally I began to see these visions like my grandmother and my great-grandmother saw them. And it was amazing. I was we were going to see someone today, and this lady's name is Mary, and she's dying of cancer, whatever the disease was. And he said, what else do you see, Paul? And I said, well, I see a, a man standing at the foot of her bed, and he's got on a red and black shirt and overalls, and that's her brother. And uh, he'll be uh, he'll be crying when we we uh, go in, and and of course at that time the only people he prayed for was in that mode, you know, that be thy will, dear Father. We know that uh, there's healing in the resurrection, and uh, whatever you know, so on. Well, anyway, I didn't have a lot of success in people getting healed because I was kind of under his covering there, but uh, he was very Im impressed with. The fact that I would know a name and know uh, what was wrong with a person. So there was a little fame that trickled out 
from him to the full gospel people that had moved to town. And finally, the Assemblies of God built a, a large church in Dallas, and it's called Memorial Assembly of God. I don't know where you've heard of that or not, but that's way in the past. I don't know where it exists today or not. If it didn't, it could have been my fault if it doesn't. But anyway, the word leaked out that I was a boy prophet and that I was a seer and the secret of the Lord was with me and I could uh, see the sins. In fact, uh, you know, I'd tell him uh, this person, um, uh, you know, is in this kind of sin or that kind of sin when we go pray for them. And he'd check all these things out. And so he leaked this word out. And he'd already told me, he said, Paul, someday when you grow up, if you stay true to the Lord and humble before the Lord, he's going to use you in a public ministry. So we can't use it here at our church, but so there will be some place it can be used. And so he told the Assemblies of God Church about me, and so they invited me to preach my first message. The only message I'd ever preached before was just to uh, railroad spikes. I would uh, nail these big nails up in the ground, and uh, they're working on the railroad down here. Do I have time to go through this? This is a long rabbit trail. I'll be back with verse 5. But... Um, I, they were working on the railroad in Garland, and uh, so I went down there and gathered up as many of these big spikes as I could, and I'd bring them back home and drive them up into the ground. I knew it was going to be evangelist because uh, I, I never had enough of them. I wanted a big crowd, so I finally got me a, an enormous uh, field of people out there. I drove all these spikes out. So I'd stand up there and, and uh, read as much as I could uh, out of the little New Testament, and, and I'd wait for a response. But it was just like at the Baptist church. There was, uh, there was none. And so I knew there should be some kind of response. So one day I remember crying, and I looked up to heaven, and I said, Oh, Lord, someday I'll be a real preacher, and these will be real people, and they'll say real amens. And then Mike got up here and told you not to do that tonight. But uh, I appreciate that, Mike. If I need it, can I ask for it? I asked you not to do that, and then uh, I changed my mind right in the middle of it because I don't want to wind up in my backyard again and feel like I'm seen. But anyway, this story about knowing the secrets of people's hearts and knowing the sins in their life, this was really magnified. I mean, it was blown out of proportion by the time I was invited to this memorial assembly. You know, I came into that church and I shook from my head to the the tips of my extremities. I was just shaking all over with, with fear. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to preach to these real people. And I said, oh, God, please get me out of this the best way you can. And so I got up there when they introduced me as the boy wonder. And uh, all of a sudden, I just started shaking even more violently. And these people thought that I was under the spell of God and was going to call out their sins. And we had the, the most magnanimous altar call you ever saw. And I didn't even open my mouth. I couldn't imagine what was happening. So there's a lot of people in sin, and they came running to the front. And uh, the service was over. I mean, all pandemonium broke out, and they were crying, and we had revival. And the word got out that I caused that. And friends, I had nothing to do with that, nothing at all. So that was my claim to fame with the Pentecostals way back then in the, in the, in the 40s. And so uh, after that, I had invitation to come and do that same thing again. And, uh, you know, all I could do is shake. But, but then I got a lot of boldness. And so I turned down all those invitations. And then uh, the Lord began to show me where to go. And I would forget the invitations. And I remember the first time I felt this leading. I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, I went to Bethel Temple, fashionable uh, AG church. Uh, AG, that's the Greek for Assembly of God. Uh, that cuts the message down a little. But anyway, I went to this uh, AG church, and Dr. William Ward was the pastor, and I, I was just a greenhorn kid, and I went and I said, AG, that's the Greek for Assembly of God. Uh, that cuts the message down a little. But anyway, I went to this uh, AG church, and Dr. William Ward was the pastor, and I, I was just a greenhorn kid, and I went and I said, Dr. Ward, Jesus sent me here, and he told me if you'd have me for a meeting, he'd restore Bethel Temple, and hundreds of people will come, and uh, you'll wind up with them, and uh, God told me he's going to heal hundreds of sick people if you'd have me for a meeting. 
So Dr. Ward believed every word of it. He began to cry, and he said, I really believe the Lord sent you, son. And so he said, I, I want to let you know something in the morning. So in the morning, he called me, and he said, Oh, little brother, I have some bad news for you. He said, My board got together, and they voted unanimously not to have you. They said you were a novice, and uh, we couldn't take a chance on, uh, on you at this time. So I said, Well, that's all right. Because I remember there was a tabernacle downtown that was built uh, from the Raymond T. Ritchie meetings. And it was twice as big or bigger than Bethel Temple. Bethel Temple was a good-sized church. It was an independent church. and So I went independent instantly. And so I went over to this tabernacle to seat 1,500 people. And uh, I uh, told Dr. Conley the same story. I said, I went over to Bethel Temple. The Lord told me to. And they turned me down. But the Lord said, he'll give you double. And that goes right along with my message now. He'll give you double if you'll take a chance on me. He said, well, kid... You may be just what we're looking for. He said, we're having a, a tough time here. We can't uh, fill this place. And I have three radio broadcasts today. He said, when would you like to start? I said, oh, tonight. I didn't have a lick of sense. He said, well, we can't do that. He said, how about Sunday? This is like Wednesday or t Thursday. And I said, well, that's okay. He said, okay, well, we'll start then. So he got me a room, and I didn't eat a bite. I, didn't, I don't think I even drank water. I thought when you fasted, you know, you're not supposed to drink water or eat back in those days. It's marvelous the way my immortality held out. But um, um, I, I don't have time to tell you how that came to an end. But um, anyway, uh, I just fasted and prayed and began to see visions of things that were going to happen in the meeting. Well, the first meeting came around. It was really wonderful because first time... I'd ever had a public meeting where I was able to do this, and I wasn't nervous anymore. And the anointing was there, and the yoke was broken, and I remember looking out, there was a great crowd in that tabernacle because the advertising had brought them in. I had a lot of uh, curiosity seekers, and but a lot of sincere people needing healing. So they brought cripples, brought people on cots and stretchers, and real hard cases to that meeting. But I looked over and I saw a lady and I'm not going to tell you how I see these things because uh, right away you would uh, say, oh, that's the occult. I just want to make one thing very clear. The New Agers and, and the occult, I, I'd like for you to know that they got all this stuff from God in the first place, and the devil's had it so long we think it belongs to him. I think it's time we take it all back because God is the God of light. He's the God of the amber light and the glory. He even has light that shines above the brightness of the sun, and he converts men like Saul, turns them in, well, you know. Anyway, I saw this light over her, and uh, the, the vision came to pass. I said, lady, sitting back here in the green and white polka dot dress, you're from San Antonio, Texas, and you're crippled. Get up and run to that aisle immediately. Well, she was uh, sitting on the end of the aisle, and uh, what I didn't realize was that they had brought her in a wheelchair, and her wheelchair was sitting at, at the end of the aisle. So when she got up, she knocked two crutches over. But, uh, oh, I tell you, the, the power of God was on her. And she began to bop up and down. And uh, as she hit the aisle, and she ran not down one aisle, but she ran all the way across the front, down this aisle, and back, and then all over, up and down the aisles. And we had revival, instant revival, because she was twisted and crippled, and God healed her. And then they, a lot of things like that happened. A lot of people were called out. And... Uh, so they had what we call the power line or the prayer line. And I, the very first person I ever prayed for in a prayer line was traumatic for me because uh, I didn't know some diseases, one disease from the other. I was just a greenhorn kid. And I looked at this lady, and the angel of the Lord told me that she had colditis. And I didn't know what that was, but I thought, well, that's, you know, uh, whatever it is. I found a place for it. She had the cutest little nose. And I reached out and took a hold of the end of her nose, and I said, Oh, you old colitis, come out in Jesus' name. And she had the most beautiful look on her face. She was very accommodating. And God healed that woman of uh, colitis, healed her colon instantly. But uh, I, I, I didn't know where that was. <laughs> the Lord did and healed her. Then others were told by name what they had wrong with them, but I couldn't find a place for it, but God healed them. And uh, then a little girl was brought in the line, and she had a tiny uh, stub of an arm, a birth defect, very serious birth defect. And this family had so much faith, and I didn't know any better, 
I just said, Oh, God, give this little darling girl a new arm. And I meant it with all my heart. I just knew God would give her a new arm. Well, a phenomenon began to take place beyond our imagination. Her little stub of an arm began to grow several inches a day. And before the meeting was over, she had formed tiny little fingers and a thumb, the end of that stub. And the parents got so excited. Now, by this time, we were, I tell you, we, we couldn't hold the people. They were, we had to move outside and um, have an outdoor meeting. Even the governor of Oklahoma put money in the meeting and helped sponsor that meeting. It was so awesome before it was over. But they took that little girl to their religious leaders, and they looked at her and said, this is witchcraft, this is black magic, don't have anything to do with this. You could even lose your life with this kind of a, a cult. I tell you, God's people, some of them are just that stupid and just that ignorant today. And those are Greek words for something awful. But uh, they really are, and it's a shame. They haven't seen a light in so long, they think all lights are from the devil. They haven't seen a wandering so long, they wonder if that's of the devil. So it's a shame. But anyway, uh, that arm stopped growing, and uh, that was a very sad thing. But it was, just, it was like, I would have, you should have, you should have believed, I would have, I would have allowed that to happen. Well, that gave me so much faith that um, I began to call out everything I saw. I had not had a revelation of the mercy of God. And I certainly didn't have any wisdom from God. But I began to call out everything I saw after that. And uh, sins were called out. And believe me, some of those sins I didn't know. But I just knew this one in the, the uh, blue suit was messing around, that one in the red dress. And uh, oh, it was all pandemonium broke loose. And so I was calling out sins and all that. And the pastor called me in and he said, Little brother, uh, you've got to employ a little finesse. I said, well, what's that? I never heard of that. He said, well, you've got to be, go a little easy. He said, your area of expertise. I said, well, what's that? Well, he said, look, you have a gift where you can, oh, you're good. Oh, boy, you're good with sickness, and that's your specialty. You're good with discerning sickness and disease, and that's all God wants you to do. I said, no, he shows me these other things, and this is great. I enjoy it very much. And uh, he said, well, I don't. I've got two board members that are resigning if I uh, can't stop you. And he said, would you please, please take it easy. Don't do that. I said, well, I'll try. He said, oh, thank you. Well, the next night was a great power night. It was all disease night. It was all sickness night. But I thought, my, this is so wonderful. I don't have any excitement in my life, and uh, this is wonderful to do this. So I just called a whole gob out of him out that night. And uh, I noticed the pastor left, and then when he came back, he uh, pulled me into his office, and he said, Oh, son, he said, Little brother, I have some wonderful news for you. I just heard from a pastor friend of mine. I just talked with him in Sacramento, California, and he has the largest church in Sacramento, and he needs you immediately. He, you know, little brother, there's more sin in California than, than there is in Oklahoma, and this brother wants you out there immediately. He wants you to start Sunday night. So, oh, well, this is good. And so I got the idea that uh, the Lord wanted me to specialize in that. So I got out there to the Sacramento meeting, and I just thought I'd just start out with that. And uh, the very first meeting, uh, the ushers were ready to take out the offering, and I just couldn't hardly wait. This anointing came on me, uh, and I looked, and I saw this usher standing there, big old burly six-foot-four uh, type guy, uh, and he had an offering bag in his hand. And uh, I looked at him, and all of a sudden, I looked over, and I saw a little lady in a, a blue dress over here. And I looked back and saw a lady in a green dress or whatever way back over here, and I saw something awful going on, and I said, you, you standing there, usher, brother, you hypocrite, you old hypocrite, thus saith the Lord. And I was, a, you know, just a, a boy, and he looked at me, stung and startled, and I said, yes, you know what you're going to do? 
You see this lady over in the blue dress? She's your wife and you have two children, as if they didn't know. So this lady sitting back here in the green dress, after this meeting's over, you're going to run away with her. You old hypocrite, thus saith the Lord, shame on you. Well, by that time he dropped the offering bag, and he was running toward the podium. All the ushers all over the place ran up to restrain him. And I thought, I'm doing all this out of the jealousy of God, for the je I mean, my jealousy and zeal for God. And I tell you, he came up there, and uh, I said, leave him alone. He can't hurt the man of God. So he came up and he fell right in front of the podium, looked up at me, face just drenched with tears. He said, it's all true, little brother. What on earth am I going to do? And with tender love and mercy, I looked at him and I said, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't move in that area. All I know is what's wrong. Well, that was so awesome. People began to come to the altar, and what I said, there's a lady sitting back here in a red dress, uh, pointed around, and I said, I'll give you 20 seconds to get down here and fall in this altar by this man and, and confess your sins. If you, and she wouldn't do it. And I said, all right. If you don't get down here in 20, I'll give you 20 more seconds, I think it went like that. You get down here and, and uh, get right with God, or I'm going to tell what you were doing in room 102 at the El Camino uh, Motel. And uh, I said, that lady said, both of them, uh, they ran down. And uh, there's others that came because they thought they were going to get hit. <laughs> and, and before it was over, uh, there were lifestyles that I didn't know about at that time. And I uh, pointed a, a man out, and I said, uh, something awful has been going on between you and uh, this uh, boy over here. And I said, uh, hey, boy, if you don't come to this altar in 20 seconds, I'll tell what you've been doing with that boy over there. And uh, he looked at a guy sitting next to him, and he said, will he really? And the guy next, sitting next to him, I just read his lips. He said, yes, he certainly will. And so about a half a dozen gay people, they called them something else then, they got us and ran forward. And the, the meeting came to a close, and I'd never closed a meeting before in my life. I didn't know how to give the benediction. I sure knew how to do the rest, but I didn't know how to close the meeting. And no pastor could be found. The host pastor was missing. <laughs> so I uh, dismissed the best I could. My people took me back to the motel the next morning. A staff member called and said, Pastor, I want you to listen to his broadcast at 8.30 on KCVR. Be sure and listen. I said, well, why didn't he call? Said, I don't know, but he told me to, and he, has, he wants to tell you something over the radio. <laughs> so anyway, I tuned into the radio broadcast, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the midst of one of the most awesome awakenings that we've ever known in Pentecost. So we have a, a little boy here, and he's uh, the terror of the tabernacles. That he uh, uh, calls people out and tells them their diseases, their ages, and whether they have the Holy Ghost or not, and what churches they belong to, and they're healed. But he said, he does something else. He calls people sins out, and he said, oh, I tell you, he did this, and the Lord did that through him, and, and hundreds of people were in that altar screaming their heads off, getting right with God. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, where were you when all this is going on? And I thought that myself. He said, I was under the piano. And, you know, in those days they had, uh, they had curtains all around the piano, and that's the reason I couldn't see him. You remember those days when they put the curtains around the big baby grand? That's the reason I couldn't see him. And he said, yes, I was repenting of my sins for the past uh, many years. He said, yes, I know what you're thinking now. I know those sins were forgiven, but just in case just in case. And that's what you'll do if you come out tonight. And so after the broadcast, he called me and said, little doc, did you hear the program? And I said, yes, sir. And I wonder where you were last night. He said, has the Lord shown you anything about me? And I said, no. Because at that time, I thought preachers, I never did try to tune in on them. I thought they were all angels. <clears throat> now, let's move on. <laughs> but anyway... Things went on, and God began to... But I was so jealous for God that the next night, 
I got up and I said, if any of your loved ones die during this meeting, bring them to the meeting. We'll raise them from the dead. I thought, sure, the pastor's going <laughs> to hide on the pan again. His face flushed white with, uh, I think, the white flush of God. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, somebody did die during that meeting. A Catholic couple that was attending, their little baby died. And they were bringing that little darling to the meeting to be raised from the dead. It had not been for the Catholic priest stopping them, they would have brought that baby. And I know beyond any doubt that baby would have been raised from the dead because that was a kind of faith so real you could see it. That was a kind of faith so real, childlike. I'd give anything if we could get back there, and we're headed back there. But this time it's not going to be the big eyes or little hues or superstar structure. It's going to be the mystical body of Christ, and we'll have all those faceless people in this ministry in the last days, and you won't know who's doing what. All you'll know is they're just doing whatever, and uh, God will, uh, will be getting the glory for it. Anyway, I just told you all that to tell you that I started out with so much zeal and jealousy for my God and for his Christ that I believed that he could do anything, and he did the impossible. Uh, I may tell you a little more about that tomorrow night, but I promise uh, to get with the message a little better. But anyway, let's pick up with verse 5. You remember the address, Numbers 25, verses 1 through 13. Verse 5, So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Now, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of, of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took uh, a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her body, so that the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were uh, 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was jealous, or he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. It is those who know something about the jealousy of God who will have an everlasting covenant of marvels, of signs and wonders in these last days. We don't know what healing is all about until we learn what jealousy really means on the part of God. Understanding the jealousy of God, we have to possess the passion and the jealousy for God before we see this. And here in Numbers 25. 1 through 13, we had some special attention given to the deep burden concerning the jealousy of God. And I call this the burden of the Lord for the hour. If I have one consuming passion and one burden upon me, it is the passion I have for God and for his jealousy. And my uh, uh, instruction to you tonight is hear what Paul of old says when he said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. There is a godly jealousy. And he said, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste uh, bride, a virgin bride to the Lord Jesus. And I tell you, God is jealous over that. And anybody that's out for that, God's going to watch over them. And a thousand will fall at one side and ten thousand at their right hand. And the plague will not come near their dwelling because they'll take that spear and they'll use it jealously and wisely and correctly for God. I wish I could have used that the right way in the early days, but I didn't. But now I've got another shot at it. I have another opportunity. And while I have this and while it is day, I'm going to live out my days and work for the night is coming, and I'm going to indoctrinate everybody I can find with this jealousy of God. And I want to impart this passion to you and tell you if you are jealous for the same things God Almighty is jealous for, he'll begin to protect you. And there's going to be an outrageous, outlandish epidemic of AIDS and communicable cancer that's coming upon the face of the earth in these last days. 
And God won't let your children get AIDS. God won't let your children catch AIDS. He won't let your children catch this form of cancer. If you will become so jealous for him, he will give you protection. You'll not be as those who do not have protection, for he protects that which is holy and that which is holy is. W-H-O-L-L-Y. There is a purpose in all this. The principle of God's jealousy must be in the foundation of the church and in all the ministries of the church. The Lord has shown me that in the 1990s, God's going to release his jealousy into the hearts of his people. If they will seek God and they will seek him with all of their hearts, he will give you this jealousy. God will hear and he'll answer that. Um, and you'll not be disappointed, and God will release his jealousy into the people. And what an awesome thing to be a people filled with God's jealousy. Individuals, leadership, must begin to understand the jealousy of God in a new and living way. And uh, there's an old adage that said, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. I want you to forget about that because God said, I'll do all things new. And if he did the old things for you tonight, it'd be new to you because you never even saw the old things. Many of you are of a generation uh, that never saw the old things. If we could just present the old things, it'd be so delicious to you tonight. You'd take it and run with it and start another revival. And God said, uh, I will take away the old that I may establish the new. So God's a, a new order man. He's looking for a new breed. He's looking for a new company, a new people. He's looking for people who will uh, be wholly his and who will be consumed with his jealousy and his purpose. One of the first revelations that God ever gave of himself to Israel was a revelation of his jealousy. I won't have time to read Exodus chapter 20 and the commandments of God. Uh, right after the first commandment, God establishes his jealousy in the second commandment. And that's just how important it is. But how many messages do you ever hear on the jealousy of God? What is God jealous for? God is jealous for three things and many more. But we need the Father's jealousy for his Son, Jesus. The Father is filled with holy jealousy for his glorious Son, Jesus. And uh, in uh, Matthew 17 and St. John 17, he tells us that the same love, the same jealousy that he has over his son, that we can share it, we can have it, he'll give it to you, he will, it's available. In fact, the intimacy with God that's available to you tonight, before you leave this place, you're going to be without excuse because we, not God, established and determined the amount of intimacy that we have with him. And I indict every one of you, including myself, there's a ringing indictment in the air tonight, and it's saying you and I are just as close to God as we choose to be. And if you choose to take up the vacancy where John's head once leaned on Jesus' breast, you can have that spot tonight because no one seems to be going for it. You can have that kind of intimacy to hear the heartbeat of God. You can be so close to him. You can know his mind, his heart. You can feel the presence and the will are the divine purpose in the Son of the living God. That place is available insofar as intimacy is concerned. We don't take time to be holy, so we're not holy. That, that's something that requires development. That's something, uh, as one has said, uh, uh, gifts are given, fruits are grown. We uh, will accept the gifts and we'll run with them and we'll play games with them. But God said, I'm calling you to a more serious purpose for a more serious purpose now. I'm giving you time to grow. And uh, as you said, uh, Gary, he's coming to the church before he comes for the church. And he's going to get you prepared. He's preparing a bride and he's so jealous over the bride for his son that uh, you won't be able to get away with things that you once got away with. We need the father's jealousy for his son. God has desired to release the love that he has for Jesus into our hearts. In James 4 and 5, God declares his jealousy for his Holy Spirit. It's a remarkable phenomenon when you see God the Father dumping the glory on Jesus the Son and Jesus dumping it on the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost dumping it back on Jesus and then Jesus reserving certain honor that will only be given to the Father. You can't have it. I can't have it. It's something reserved just for the Father and he's jealous over that. But anyway... Uh, we should be very careful to hear James 4, 5. Uh, God declares his jealousy with every release of his Holy Spirit, whatever degree, whatever measure that release is. He releases his uh, jealousy in accordance with that principle. Whenever God releases his spirit, then he comes with jealousy. He is intensely jealous or protective of that which possesses his spirit. 
Know ye not that your temples are the Holy Spirit, your containers are the Holy Spirit, you're the house of God, you're what God was speaking about, Jesus was speaking about in, in St. John 14, uh, 2, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, you're the house of God, he's not building a mansion next door to mother, next door to himself, for you and me, it took him six days to make the heavens and the earth and all that's therein, but it's taken him 2,000 years to make a temple not made with hands, to make something worthy of God and his Christ to come and dwell in, and you and I are the containers, the houses, we are the house of God, and he says, I'm coming to my house. I'm coming to my sanctuary. Ready or not, some will be destroyed. Others will be made. Others will come into a place where they'll be glistening, shining, lively, living stones. And we'll be a representative of all that the God uh, that we call Father is like. And he'll show himself in his house. We'll walk these streets someday or we'll be on a hill as a light that can't be hid as a city, if you will. And the whole nations began to see us. And a nation will flow to you in a day as the church of the living God is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes the spirit of the Father to draw and if you want a mega church, forget about it until you get the Spirit of the Father and you'll get one like it or not. You'll get one without all the fanfare and Madison Avenue and, and Wall Street gimmicks and techniques. You'll get it. You'll get it, my friend. If you allow God the Father to come and live in his house, a nation will look at you, this nation, and they will say, don't tell us where your God is. We see him living in his house and whose house we are. Glory to God. I tell you, if I could feel that again, I'd go down one of those trails just for a minute, but I'm not going to. I can always tell when I'm under the anointing. After a takeoff like that, I'm supposed to drop dead. Glory. All right, if we receive the Holy Spirit of God in these last days, then we must also know that God will be jealous to the same degree that he entrusts his Holy Spirit to a people or to a ministry and so forth. God is jealous for holiness and the things of God. God has an intense jealousy for holiness to be in his people, in his church, and in the ministries. God wants us to be as jealous for holiness as he is. And uh, we should have that desire tonight to be holy as he is holy. God will give this jealousy to anyone who seeks him for it tonight. Now, my purpose tonight in offering this brief study, this synopsis of the jealousy of God, is to give you some seed thoughts to meditate on. And I sincerely trust that it will pr provide something for you to meditate on. And this essential aspect to receiving personal revelation of God's jealousy is very important to me, and it's more important to God. So I want to tell you my two objectives tonight are to help you to understand God's jealousy as you meditate on the scriptures that I've been using and will use. And secondly, I trust that God will impart to your hearts a great measure of jealousy for him. Amen. The children of Israel were introduced to the jealousy of God in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10 through 15. I won't be able to Turn there and read that. I want you to study that later. But the God of the Bible has revealed himself over and over as jealous for his Son, for his Holy Spirit, and especially the Word. And uh, as God manifests greater measure of his power, his jealousy will also be manifested in greater measures. As God entrusts to us more of the things that are dear to his heart, then he requires that we have greater carefulness and remember Mark uh, 4, 23, uh, uh, with greater carefulness, we must uh, hear what he, what he says and see what it is that he's revealing to us about holy things, because he will bring judgment insofar as our acceptance and treatment of, the, of holy things. Something is coming where we have to have clean hands and a pure heart.